college student vanished without a trace. Her abandoned car was found in one city, her belongings in another. Some dirt on a pair of shoes revealed the extent of one man's deception. Michigan State University is the seventh largest in the United States with a campus in East Lansing that spans over 5,000 acres. With more than 45,000 students, police are often called to investigate when one of them fails to stay in touch. From time to time, we'll get missing persons reports around here. And the majority of the time, they're going to be bogus. Uh, somebody runs off with you know, somebody else or boyfriend forgets to report home, things of that nature. In July of 2000, 26-year-old Michelle Salerno, a graduate student studying speech pathology, went missing. She didn't show up at a family picnic, and she wasn't answering her telephone. And so I called the East Lansing Police Department to do a an apartment check. You know, they can go over to check. And they went over there and she wasn't there. Michelle lived in an apartment just off campus. We saw no signs of uh, a violent crime occurring in the apartment or anything. It looked like a college student's apartment. But they did find two suspicious things. <laughs> evidence around the doorknob and everything to suggest lock picking. It was a regular sized couch in the living room of the apartment and the three top cushions of that couch were missing. And Michelle's car, a burgundy station wagon, was not in the apartment parking lot. There were six or seven different law enforcement agencies involved, um, most of whom had no actual stake in the case themselves, but volunteered people to uh, participate in the search. There were also civilians who volunteered. Uh, there were university uh, staff and employees who assisted in the search. There were private citizens that assisted. Police issued a be on the lookout call for Michelle's car. A hundred miles away, Police in Toledo, Ohio, found it parked near the bus station. They had ticketed the car several times, an indication it had been there for a while. Yes, they a car here with a couple of tickets. No one recalled seeing Michelle Salerno in or near the car. We didn't really think it was good news because she wasn't with it. And why would it be in Toledo, Ohio? It just didn't make any sense. Michelle Salerno was separated from her husband, Dennis. When she disappeared, Dennis was living in Bowling Green, Ohio, and claimed he hadn't seen her in over a week. The last known person to see Michelle alive was her next-door neighbor, Jason. He said she helped him deliver some newspapers several days earlier. She had just recently picked up a local area paper out, basically to earn a little extra cash. And if I recall correctly, the paper out went from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Jason said he and Michelle returned to their respective apartments around 6 o'clock that morning. And that was the last time he saw her. Jason was considered a suspect for the simple fact he was the last person to see Michelle alive before her disappearance. Jason and Michelle were actually close friends. They had formed a relationship, not anything uh, outside of friendship, but uh, the relationship was tight. Based on all of the circumstances in our follow-up investigation, we were able to quickly eliminate him as a suspect. I checked in every one of Michelle's credit cards None of those things ever showed any activity whatsoever on them. Her checking account, everything had stopped, like Michelle just had disappeared, and everything about her had just ended. 
But people who disappear usually spend money. So investigators feared this was something far worse. Shortly after Michelle Salerno's disappearance, there was another suspicious incident in Ohio a few miles from Michelle's abandoned car. A truck driver was murdered in a rest stop bathroom. The victim was located on the floor of the shower. His throat had been cut. Uh, he was not clothed. Some of his personal belongings were there in the shower. The man was identified as 50-year-old Larry McClanahan, a self-employed trucker from Ohio. A background check revealed McClanahan served time in prison for sexually assaulting his 14-year-old nephew. His cellmate and best friend was none other than Dennis Salerno, Michelle Salerno's estranged husband who had served time for theft and fraud. After getting out of prison, Salerno went to live with McClanahan and his family for a period of time, so they were, they were well acquainted. McClanahan opened his door to Dennis, gave him a place to live. It also came out that Larry and Dennis shared Larry's wife. McClanahan's ex-wife informed us that they were all sexually involved together. The truck stop security camera showed McClanahan walking towards the shower room with another man carrying a large black bag. A half hour later, the man with the bag left without McClanahan. To police, the man looked like Dennis Salerno. There was also a video which shows Salerno entering a locked and secured storage area. There were clear pictures taken there. Did you kill Larry? Why would I kill Larry? When police brought Salerno in for questioning, he denied everything. But after several hours, his story changed. He said McClanahan called him a few days earlier, suggesting they meet at the truck stop. Salerno said when he got there, McClanahan admitted he, quote, took care of his wife, Michelle, since he knew Salerno was having marital problems. Dennis said, what do you mean? And McClanahan said, I took care of your wife. And he said to him, I've taken care of your problem, Dennis. Now come over here and take your clothes off and get in the shower with me. Salerno claimed McClanahan wouldn't take no for an answer and feared he would be raped. Dennis said he panicked and reached down and grabbed a knife and jabbed it backwards where McClanahan was, stabbing him in the neck. I think he was trying to, uh, uh, pardon, the, pardon the expression, to kill two birds with one stone. He was trying to implicate McClanahan as the murderer of Michelle and also extricate himself from McClanahan's murder by claiming that it was self-defense. But police were skeptical. First, the physical evidence did not support Salerno's version of events. We later found out that uh, McClanahan's neck was slashed from ear to ear and he was almost decapitated. It appears clear that McClanahan was in a vulnerable position, that his throat was cut probably from behind. He has defensive wounds indicating that he was fighting off a knife attack. That's not uh, something that falls in line with Salerno's description of what happened. And Salerno admitted he didn't ask McClanahan for details about Michelle's murder. And still, I had to ask Dennis, well, did you ask him what he did with her or how he killed her or where she's at? Dennis never asked those questions. You're not stupid. You know why we're talking about you. You're the what only you lead us to Michelle. <clears throat> how, how can I do that? How can I do that? I don't know where she is. I told you guys everything that I knew. I told you about all the friends that I knew that she had. Um, Dennis. 
Have you heard Michelle mistaken accidentally? No. I, that's not, I'm a, very, so that's not a very positive answer. Detective Vincent and I took the tape of Dennis to some Michigan State Police profilers. And one of the things that came out is that if he did murder Michelle, more than likely he would bury her, take her someplace, that they had some connection together. While Salerno admitted killing McClanahan, he denied any involvement in Michelle's murder. So investigators had to rely on forensic evidence to find out the truth. Michelle Salerno, a 26-year-old graduate student, was missing and presumed murdered. Okay, I came in here to ask you guys if you knew it, and you guys are blaming me for all kinds of crap. Her estranged husband, Dennis, told police his best friend, Larry McClanahan, killed her. An assertion police found preposterous. We investigated it, and we were never able to determine that McClanahan had, had anything to do with Michelle's murder or disappearance. Interestingly, police found Michelle's abandoned car just 10 miles from the truck stop where Salerno killed McClanahan. Inside Michelle's car, investigators found Dennis Salerno's fingerprint on the passenger side window. Michelle got the car after Dennis had moved out. The fact that her dad had recently given her the car does minimize the possibility that his fingerprints could or should be there. Next, investigators went through Salerno's personal belongings. Dennis had two storage lockers, one in DeWitt, Michigan, and one in Ohio. In both of these storage areas, he had a pack rat mentality, kept everything he ever owned or had in the past. Inside were computers, pornographic pictures, a professional lock-picking set, and one of Michelle's letters addressed to the court. We found numerous documents, one of which being a personal protection order application that Michelle had filled out that Dennis uh, should not have been in possession of at all unless he had, in fact, entered her apartment on a previous occasion and took it. I am writing to obtain a personal protection order against my husband. I fear for my safety because in the course of our marriage, he has been physically and mentally abusive toward me. Investigators sent the letter to forensic scientist Greg Michaud, who sprayed it with ninhydrin. Ninhydrin is a chemical that we use to react with the amino acids in the fingerprint residuals that are left behind. When the ninhydrin does react, the fingerprints become visible in a purple color. On this document, Michaud found prints from two different individuals. There were two palm prints that were identified to Dennis Salerno, and then there were three fingerprints that we were able to identify to Michelle Salerno. Investigators believe Dennis stole this letter from Michelle's apartment. That letter was drafted the night before her death. Dennis was not residing with her, and there's no reason that his prints should have ever been on that letter. But Dennis Salerno continued to deny he killed his estranged wife, Michelle, insisting his friend, Larry McClanahan, did. Well, it's a great alibi to be able to accuse someone of a, a homicide when they're dead. Because uh, you can pin everything on that dead person, and the dead person cannot talk. He was caught on the McClanahan murder and the prosecutor there were putting together a possible death penalty case against him and we came to that agreement if he told us where the body was we wouldn't use that information in a trial against him and the Ohio prosecutors would seek only a 20-year prison sentence for the murder of McClanahan so Salerno took the deal 
and gave investigators the location of Michelle's body. He told us that Larry McClanahan had told him that he had buried Michelle on top of this, this dump site, which was 10 acres, and it was a large area, a huge dump site. After several days of searching, investigators finally found a woman's body. They needed some way to make an identification. I got a hold of Michelle's mom and said, do you by chance still have one of Michelle's baby teeth? And so she gave us one or two of the baby teeth and there was still enough of the pulp or dentine present that they were finally able to get a known sample of her DNA. The DNA confirmed the body was Michelle Salerno. She had been strangled to death. There was a defect in the hyoid bone, which is a three-part bone in your throat, which is generally a, a good indicator that uh, strangulation has been a mechanism of death. You feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off your shoulders once you finally found her. And then, then of course, you know, what you've hoped for for so long can be very devastating. Investigators were convinced that Dennis Salerno was involved in Michelle's murder, especially when they found a lock-picking set in his possession and a pair of mud cake shoes in his storage locker. These just stuck out because they had been rolled up inside a floor mat of the car. Detective Quick was in charge of taking care of the the trace evidence at that time and got a hold of a professor at Michigan State University who we called the Dirt Doctor. The Dirt Doctor was Tom Vogel, a professor of geological sciences. I always thought they called me the Rock Doctor. <laughs> he said, my results here could actually be damaging to your investigation because if my results are found to be generic, that could actually give Dennis Salerno, uh, an alibi as far as him not being there. Vogel took samples from Salerno's shoes and from Michelle's body. He ground each one to a fine powder, then heated the samples to 1,000 degrees centigrade. He did the same for the dirt sample from the landfill. And this soil was the most unique. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. When they brought the materials back, I saw, wow, you know, these are really unusual soils. The soils that had high levels of metals like nickel, zinc, and even hafnium, which is probably the most unusual metal to find uh, in a soil. Astonishingly, the dirt on Salerno's shoes matched the dirt found on Michelle's body. And the dirt wasn't from the landfill. That body had been moved. She was definitely buried someplace else first. The soil that was right on in contact with the body did not have these heavy metals. This meant that Michelle's body had been previously buried at another location, and that Dennis was the one who buried her. The soil also matched soil in the wheel wells of Michelle's car. It puts him at the scene with forensic evidence, trace evidence, and shows that he is involved in the burial of his wife. Friends of Michelle and Dennis Salerno say their relationship was doomed from the start. They eloped after knowing each other for only a month. Michelle's parents were appalled. I just wanted to find out more about Dennis since we knew very little about him. So I hired a private investigator. And he uncovered his criminal past. That was more shocking to me than when she got married. I was just really upset about that. When Michelle found out about her husband's criminal past, 
She asked for a divorce. She had found out that he was a homosexual, found out that he had been in prison, and they had had several domestic arguments that uh, someone would get hurt, either he or she would uh, be hurt. Although Dennis and Michelle were living separately, Michelle feared for her safety. The forensic evidence shows that Dennis entered Michelle's apartment while she was at work, possibly to pick up some of his things. And he found the protection order she planned to file against him. He was incensed. And when she returned from her job delivering newspapers, he strangled her to death. No one knows how he got her body outside and into her car or where he first buried her. But mud found on Salerno's shoes matched the dirt on Michelle's body. Later, he moved her body to the landfill in Ohio. Then, abandoned Michelle's car, leaving his fingerprint on the window. To cover his tracks, Salerno needed someone to take the blame for Michelle's murder and chose his old prison cellmate, Larry McClanahan. He lured him to the truck stop and slit his throat. Dennis was always trying to pin McClanahan as killing his wife. In fact, later on, it came out that uh, Dennis knew exactly where Michelle was buried. And the shoes in which were found at, in Dennis's locker being his, uh, the soil on his shoes were matched up to the soil samples on Michelle's body. Dennis Salerno pleaded guilty to Larry McClanahan's murder, but not guilty to Michelle's murder. He was convicted of both, however, and sentenced to two life terms prison without parole. Don't have to prove motive, only have to prove cause of death. And that it was Dennis Salerno that did it. And the evidence was really overwhelming when looked at as a whole. The forensic evidence proved Salerno handled Michelle's court-related documents. But the most unusual evidence was the forensic geology. The key that tied him to the murder was the dirt evidence, the unusual quality of the dirt as described by the scientists in this case. How he would have had that on his shoes and it be on her body is only explained by him being associated with that body and its burial. Without the soil samples, we wouldn't have been able to say that Dennis was responsible for this murder because those soil samples alone, he could not dispute because those were his shoes and that soil sample was the biggest part of our case. From what I understood, and he was going to get life without parole, I was just like, oh, thank God. Thank God, now finally Michelle has some justice.